Thanks, Ken. Um, good morning, everybody. I um, make no apologies, in a sense, for the content of this presentation. Um, I, as Ken has mentioned, am a respiratory physician, just, just retiring. And I, I guess I could fill uh, the, the morning with tragedies, which I don't want to do, because I've spent, since I was 36, my life as a respiratory physician with a major interest in occupational lung diseases, where things have just gone tragically wrong. So I really don't make any apologies about the content of the talk today. Um, I want to run through why. Why is it important to protect workers from welding fume? And um, I, I, the answer hopefully will become self-evident by the end of the uh, talk. Um, I want to thank HSC Northern Ireland for asking me to speak. It means a lot to me. And I want to thank Ken for the fantastically beautiful Winter Wonderland um, presentation this morning. It was absolutely gorgeous. Um, speaking about gorgeous and beautiful things, let's move straight on to, to these. Now, I don't say that lightly. You only get two of these. It, it's very, very unlikely you'll ever be given a third. And... I think the, the lay perception of your lungs, these are your lungs, these are what you're sitting with now, is that they're sort of cartoon balloons and they've got sort of air in them and that's, that's about it. But it's anything, anything but that. This is a cadaveric cast um, when a dead individual has had polymer poured into their lungs. And you can see the, the frankly beautiful structure of the inside of your lungs. There's the bronchial tree. You can see the trachea running down here into the right upper lobe, left lung. And this truncated area here is the aorta. You can see that these are a vascular bag of blood and gas. Gas is normally air, but it's the stuff that you're breathing in from this room. And workers in complicated work environments are, are breathing in from the, from the workplace. So... We're going to run through a little bit about the lungs first, and then I want to talk very briefly about the interface between welding fume and those lungs. But I think the fundamentally most important thing is that we are amazing. I got up this morning about quarter to seven, and I've taken 2,000 breaths already. And you'll have done the same. And I would ask you to consider if you thought about any of those. So you are totally automatic, but if you're a welder that develops breathing problems, it's anything but, unfortunately. So here's a little super view of the lung. Um, nobody expected biology first thing on a Tuesday morning in Belfast, but here we go. These are the alveoli. You can see they are absolutely intricately beautiful. About 300 million of these per lung. But they are extremely fragile. And I don't know if you can see the pointer on the main screen at the back, but this is a gossamer thin membrane between the alveoli. And through those run thousands and thousands of little blood vessels in your lung now. And you can see that these are amazing, but massively vulnerable to attack. And I'm going to show you some examples of where this has particularly happened with welding fume exposures. And we've also got to be fantastically resilient so that the lungs that you and I have, well, obviously, perhaps we're not going to summit Everest without the use of supplemental oxygen, but this guy clearly is with the Sherpa. And they look pretty, pretty happy. So the lungs are able to sustain you, humans, in really, really abnormal situations. About a third of an atmosphere at the top of Everest, still with a smile on his face. I suspect probably he did put the oxygen mask on soon after the, um, the photograph was taken, but the same is true at depth as well. So that there are humans around the coast of the UK, and Steve and others are massively involved in the regulation of the health of divers around the GB coast. And these guys in saturation bells will be living their life at... Um, th this type of atmosphere, 2021 20, atmospheres, and again, looking very happy. And it's the lungs which are able to sustain individuals doing this. 
Um, I think in 1992, a Frenchman set the record for, I think, two or three hours at 71 atmospheres, the, the equivalent of about 700 meters of seawater. So the image I'm trying to portray very early on around protecting lungs is it's important to do, but your lungs will not take massive insults. Uh, eventually, they, they will fail. But there is a, a huge plasticity, a huge reserve in all of the lungs that are represented here this morning. And pretty much finally, by way of introduction, this is not uh, happening by chance. And I wanted just to spend a moment, although it looks a bit of a weird slide, just to um, get you to, th just to think a little bit about what happens. The diagram on the left-hand side just shows your rib cage. And it, um, yeah, well, David, that's your ribs, isn't it? Well, of course it is. But your ribs are ex extremely complicated. It is not like a hinge on the door out to the coffee room. The ribs are articulated onto your spine, but also onto your sternum, and they move in two particular ways. The function of your thorax, when you go back to work and are breathing in the air in your workplace, is designed to absolutely maximally fill your lungs with air. And when you take a breath out fast, you get a peak flow. Uh, many of you in the room will have asthma. And you will know that when you take your own peak flow, that's what you're doing. You're measuring your peak flow. But look at how rapidly the lungs can breathe out. We are designed to breathe out. <laughs> Breathing is a bit boring by comparison. You can see here that you have a very sort of laconic almost breathing in. So the introduction I'm trying to portray is if you've never thought about your breathing in your lungs, now is the time to consider it before we uh, go down the route of working out what goes badly wrong or can go wrong if workers aren't protected from ver various types of insults in the, in the workplace. And I really don't think many people understand the intricacies that you're dealing with. I also teach the medical students around pulmonary physiology, and it's always news to them about how complicated we are on the inside. So my final slide before I ask you a question um, is that it all comes down to this. This, again, beautiful transmission electron microscope shows a red blood cell, a single red blood cell. This is your blood. It's what makes you red when you, when you bleed. And this is a micron thick. So this is the great outdoors here. This is air. So all of us in this room are about a micron away from bleeding to death up our tracheas. That is the bottom line. And when you go back to your workplaces, if I was to say to you, well, you've got a machine that relies on a micron thin membrane, it's, it's moving um, 10 times a minute, 600 times an hour, um, 2,000 times every three hours, you'd be looking for the instruction manual. Well, I would say that's what your workers have got. And not looking after their lung health will lead to disruption of this interface. So if you don't know your next door neighbor, now is an absolutely fantastic time to get to know them because I'm going to pose you a question. We're talking about air coming in and out of the alveolus. Clearly, the quality of that air will dictate in us, in this room, and also in workplaces, your respiratory health. It is as simple as that. So I'd like you to have a think. Chat amongst yourselves, your next door neighbor, say hi, and I'm going to give you four options. What do you think the volume of air breathed in in a lifetime is in litres. It's not meant to be an easy question, no phone a friend, no 50-50, but have a chat to your next neighbour and we'll have a vote in a moment. I'll give you 30 seconds just to have a little think. I'm sure I heard somebody talking about Liverpool's 7-0 victory, so we've got to move on. We've got to move on. Right. So what, what am I bid for an extremely large number? We've got 14 million there. Anybody willing to 
Put the hand up if someone's scratching the nose at the back, I like that, not wanting to commit. What about, I mean, these numbers are enormous, aren't they? 85 million litres, somebody definitely committed there, I think. What about, um, now we're getting up to enormous numbers, 117 million litres of air that you'll breathe in in an average lifetime, don't forget, 70 years old, breathing about 12 per minute, just to give the game away a bit. And um, what about the final number, 220 million litres? Definitely no one there, is everyone all asleep? Thank you very much. And the answer is, of course, I'm gonna make it the largest number, there we go. Um, but th th for the geeks, um, this is important, and I include myself in that, because you take about 441 million breaths in a lifetime, and um, this is an enormous number for anything, made out of anything, and you take about 500 millilitres of air in. That's an awful lot of air or gas. A third of it in bed, a third of it at work, and a third doing stuff you really want to do. But the, the quality of air is so important. This is the point I'm trying to maybe labour in terms of dictating your future respiratory health when you get to, when you get to perhaps my age. So 500 mils of gas comes in. In this room, it's oxygen. Obviously, when you breathe out, you breathe out exactly the same volume, but the oxygen has been consumed or largely consumed by the body. So that is replaced, in case you were wondering, for A-level with um, water vapour. OK, so here's the first example. Um, have a look at the screens um, around the room. I apologise that the screen view is slightly smaller, but this is a chest X-ray of a patient. Um, I feel fine. I, I've got no problem at all. I had a bit of a cough. I went to my GP, and ever since I've had that x-ray, I've had the hospital on, and everybody's worried. This is the heart in the middle, and you'll have to take it from, from me in this first example that the, the lungs either side should be uh, pretty, pretty dark. Uh, I appreciate um, Paul, the respiratory physician in Belfast, is in the audience, so this will be very straightforward for him. Um, but I do appreciate there will be a varying group of individuals, some of whom will have never seen a chest X-ray before. But you can see that these lungs are absolutely stuffed full of white. And yet the worker is totally fine. Anybody want to hazard a guess, uh, apart from Paul, um, what this might what this might be. How can this be? That the lungs can look so awful on chest x-ray, here's the heart in the middle, and yet the patient feels fine. Something that they breathed in over a working life has caused that striking appearance. This is just to make the point the lungs are extremely good at picking up stuff that is breathed in. Okay, uh, it's a bit of an unfair question, isn't it? So let's move on to a slide with the answer and a clue. Aren't I being cryptic this morning, I hear you say. So here's the answer somewhere in this lot, and that's the clue. Anybody now wish to commit as to what that worker would have been exposed to over a lifetime? And again, I do apologize that it's slightly smaller on the screens in the room. Periodic table, first thing on a Tuesday morning. It's never a good thing. So there is the answer, tin. This is a tin miner. Tin obviously a metal has been breathed in over a lifetime, tin does not react adversely with the lung. It sits. What that, what's that show? That that miner was exposed to tin over a number of years and all that tin is lodged in their lungs. So think about it when you go back to your workplaces about what you're breathing in, which is lodging and staying in your lungs. Just because you feel fine may not mean that you are. So this is a, a, a teaching example almost of tin, um, associated historically, of course, now with the Cornish tin mines and the development of this very unusual condition called stanosis. So the lungs are great filters, and that, that is showing up on x-ray purely because tin has got a very high atomic, atomic number. Okay. So, the second part of the talk is talking about the lungs and welding particularly. I'm going to go through six conditions. I'm going to go through very quickly um, so that I'm not out of time, and I want to run through them in turn. It, um, and Ken has already really 
beautifully done my job for me because he's talked about all the conditions that we know um, are associated. But it's interesting hearing Ken talk because the list of lung conditions associated with welding exposures is pretty long. So there are many ways in which lungs can get sick from being exposed to welding fume. And the, the final part of this talk will be running through some, some examples. And it will be of no surprise to you that it affects not only the um, breathing tubes that we've seen already in the cadaveric cast, but also the lung tissue itself. Welding fume has got this ability to attack not just the breathing tubes, but also the actual tissue, the alveoli, that we've already seen some beautiful, beautiful images of. So, um, the first four that I'm going to talk about are very brief. Um, I'm not really going to say much at all about the second and fourth, uh, other than to give a sentence to each now. When I lived and worked in New Zealand, we did quite a big study of New Zealand welders. They were mostly young lads. And they worked for a variety of welding outfits. Air New Zealand, but some metal fabrication shops, not quite small workplaces. And some of them were doing TIG technique onto a base of stainless and were exposed significantly to chromium and nickel, for example, which as the technical experts, you're the technical experts, you will know, is much more represented in a stainless base than it might be in something like mild steel, for example. And th there is, I wouldn't say loads, but there is a body of evidence to suggest that asthma is related to um, welding fume exposure. In other words, a welder develops asthma directly as a result of welding fume exposure. Had they been a milkman or a barrister, they wouldn't have developed asthma. Simple as that. And it probably relates to stainless, but I've, I've said plus question mark, because I think there still is a bit of a, a, a concern that um, other types of welding may, may do this. COPD, and I know this is an area of interest for Steve, and you know, to be honest, I think Steve's got a really tough job. I'm sure he's gonna do it fantastically well, because it's easy for me to tell you about the problems we're trying to prevent, but actually, when you need to work out how to prevent them in workplaces, it does get tough and difficult to decide in your workplaces where you're exposing people with a residual risk after you've done everything else to welding fume, what you actually do. Um, COPD is a very difficult condition to disentangle because most of us agree it's a cigarette smoking related condition, but other exposures are relevant. Cadmium, for example, highly relevant. But imagine trying to do studies of COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, good old fashioned bronchitis and emphysema, in people who have and haven't been possibly exposed to bits of welding fume over their life. It gets very difficult to disentangle. So I'm not going to go there much more at the moment this morning. I'm very happy to deal with any questions when we have a little question and answer session later. Um, in terms of airway irritation, just to remind everybody, not necessarily the welding process itself, but sometimes it does. Um, in workplaces, your workplaces, with your lungs, th there will be the potential for the liberation of a variety of um, irritant gases. And I would not discount them. Um, Ken correctly in his introduction mentioned irritant-induced asthma. And irritant gases are extremely unpleasant, particularly if they um, are inhaled in any significant quantity. Um, I worked in Wellington for a couple of years. There was an absolute tragedy in Wellington about 30, 40 years ago when three young men, similar to some of the ages of the people who were in this room, lost their lives in the Port Authority buildings in Wellington when they were working in a confined space and they were exposed to ammonia. And each of those young men lost their lives because they couldn't get out and vote with their feet quick enough. And that, what, that is what this is basically saying. It's basically saying ammonium and sulfur dioxide are highly soluble. If I expose you lot to ammonia, you know about it immediately. You start to get itchy, watery eyes, you feel rubbish, you smell the ammonia, and you, you vote with your feet. You go out of the doors, you get away. Because it is highly soluble. Things like chlorine, ozone, much less soluble. So you can be quite happily working along, being exposed to ozone, don't really know much is happening, until you've got lung damage. And the same with cadmium also. 
So do be aware at work of irritant gases because they can cause a, a selection of very un, unpleasant issues. And I wanted to include metal fume fever because I know some of you will have had Galvi flu. I have never had Galvi flu, but I spoke to welders who have had Galvi flu lots. And it, you know yourself better than I do. It relates, like, likely relates to zinc. Uh, when we're talking about it last night over dinner about um, galvanizing stuff and putting a, a, a layer of zinc oxide onto a particular metal object. And it's something about fresh zinc oxide that does it. But the point is, look at the symptoms, and you can probably just read them. Fever, chills, nausea, headache, um, fatigue, muscle aches, joint aches. It's just like having proper flu. Now, how on earth does welding do that? Because the air that is breathed in with those constituents is transferred through into the bloodstream. So your lungs are a fantastic portal into your blood. So please don't just regard them as full of air and not doing much, but when your workers are breathing in welding fume, constituents of that are getting directly transferred into blood. And this is a highly inflammatory process. Well, welders with Galvi flu just feel absolutely rubbish, like you have the flu, and then obviously in the next 12, 24 hours, things start to abate. Okay, so let's move on to our fifth of six items. You'll be pleased to know we're getting through quite quickly. Um, and this is um, an X-ray of a 42-year-old man who's been iron dust exposed. And you can probably see, if you're close to the side screens there, that it's not as marked. This is the heart in the middle here. And I'll see if I can use my laser pointer without taking anybody out in the distance. I don't think I can. But um, you can see that there is white shadowing in both lung fields. Young man, again, feeling fine, no significant problems. He's been iron fume exposed, you can see here, and that's his x-ray. And this is what um, Ken had mentioned earlier on, and it's important just to consider each of these separately because they're all different conditions. This is welder's lung. This is where iron fume lodges into the, the lung. We talked about it already. The lung is fantastic at holding on to stuff that you expose it to. Some of you who've been welders for a while may indeed have welder's lung. You will only identify it when you see it on a chest x-ray. Um, it's normally seen in people who've had high levels of um, fume exposure. And generally, as with tin, people feel normally totally fine. You see it on an x-ray, and I suspect it's commoner than we believe because we don't normally x-ray welders unless there's a particular, particular problem with their, with their health. But what I thought you might like, or not like, depending, is um, to see the histology. This is the iron in the lung. So the iron doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't get breathed out, or some of it um, doesn't get breathed out. The iron that welders breathe in, that's it that brown pigment. And you can see there that the lung hasn't really turned on it, hasn't really got inflamed, it's just sat there. So welding fume will deposit iron in people's lungs. There is no doubt about that if you don't protect workers. Com compare and contrast to this horrible looking image, isn't it? But again, beautiful in its own right. This is the nasty whirls and inflammation in this case, caused by silica. So there are only a number of ways that your lungs can complain or squeal if they're given stuff to cope with, which can cause them problems. And again, a typical example of something nasty related to um, silica exposure. Now, our understanding, and I'm sure Paul would agree, over the last two decades, our ability to image your lungs welders' lungs, workers' lungs, has gone stratospheric. So we are now able to do cross-sectional imaging like you would not believe so rapidly, taking a cross-section effectively through the thorax. And some of you will have had cross-sectional imaging of your abdomen or chest if you've had CT scanning, um, but the capabilities now are really Im absolutely immense. So that is the same 
um, or similar case in somebody who's now had a CT scan. This is effectively a one millimeter, not literal of course, slice through the thorax. And you can see the heart, you can see the backbone here, but look at all these white, it's like somebody's taken a whole load of cotton wool and placed it throughout the lungs and all of this is iron. So please don't just take my word for it. This is a never smoker who was exposed to iron in his capacity um, as a shipyard welder. And you can see all of this iron in here. Welding fume will harm you if you don't protect workers from it. And you can see a, a beautiful illustration of it here. Okay. I was talking to Ken last night about um, these types of workplaces, and I suspect they're probably commoner than we think still, although I think regulatory activity has been amazing in this area to reduce the risks from these hazards. When I first took up my consultant job in Sheffield, we talked about patients having dirty lung, literally on x-ray. And the radiologists were saying, well, people living in dirty environments with dirty jobs, they just have a bit of dirt on their chest x-ray that you've sort of got to mentally extract when you're reporting the x-ray. And I suspect some, dirt, some of the dirty lung related to the huge historic metal exposed populations in Sheffield. And I suspect Belfast is probably no different, but from different style of um, industrial techniques. Okay, so finally, I'm gonna talk about lung cancer and then I'm going to sit down. Just quickly looking at my watch, I think we're okay for another few minutes. Lung cancer, um, about, about 12 to 10% of it is attributable to workplace exposures. Um, you can see there's a slight differential between men and women. And the typical workplace carcinogens are the ones I've listed there. The ones that with a piece of paper you could probably have um, given me. Asbestos, cadmium, beryllium, and so on. Um, the next photograph does show a lung cancer. So this is not bad, I don't think, if you're a bit squeamish. This is the inside of a normal uh, lung. You can see the lovely division between the right and left lung. Off you go into the left lung. Off you go into the right lung. Right lung is more vertically disposed. That's why peanuts and foreign objects and things that children inhale tend to go down the right lung rather than the left. This is a lung cancer. You can see it sat there so close to the carina, to the division there between the lungs, totally inoperable. That patient will die of lung cancer. You can see it's sort of fleshy, horrible appearance. And that's typically what it looks like at bronchoscopy. So I'm going to just give you 15 seconds and I'm almost done. I want you to have a think about what that patient has got in store for them. So what's the percentage of five year survival for all patients with lung cancer? And what I mean by that is, what's the chance of that individual being alive for five years? So I'll give you just a moment to chat amongst yourselves and then we'll come back with the answer. Okay, so people sitting on Paul's table have an unfair advantage, I do apologise. Um, so what am I bid now for, uh, and this is, I must say, definitely not a, a laughing matter, not that anybody is. Uh, what am I given for 80%? In other words, most people do quite well with lung cancer. Anyone willing to vote? And someone definitely scratching their face? What about 75%? So about three quarters of people alive? Anyone there? What about 46%? Just under half of people will be alive, yet few votes. What about 16%? Very, very low. Yeah, and the majority have it. Don't shoot the messenger. This is absolutely true. This is an absolutely dreadful, dreadful, I'll say it again, dreadful malignancy. It's predominantly smoking related, but occupational exposures contribute, and welding fume is no exception. As we as a society smoke less, proportionately more lung cancer will be related to non-smoking causes and that will include work, and that includes welding fume too. And that is why, as Ken mentioned, IARC have looked at this and reclassified welding fume as a carcinogen. This is not a malignancy that you want to get. 
16% five-year survival, about three in 20 individuals diagnosed today will be alive in five years, all comers in the UK. Why is that? Because lung cancer is sitting here close to the aorta and the pulmonary artery. It's only then that it starts to make symptoms. If you've got a little fella growing out here, you won't know until such time as it either touches the chest wall or you cough blood or something like that. So it typically presents late. This has to be a condition that everybody in this room wants to prevent rather than to treat, given what we know about its outcome. Um, there was a recent classification. Uh, Ken has mentioned it. I'm almost at the end. Four big studies. I'm going to give you two estimates here of the lung cancer risks. Um, two studies, 1.36 times the risk if you're welding fume exposed versus not. So this is taking into account smoking. And here's one at 1.66. Just to give you an idea, that's a 36 or a 66% increased risk. Living with a smoker who have historically been female, living with heavily smoking men, pa pass, you know, passive exposure, there's, there's still arguments about it, but generally the risk, the risk is about 20%. So you're already above the risk from welding fume than you are from passive smoke exposure. And in this study, three times, because this is 66% increased risk, not 20%. Just as an aside, if you are an active smoker, you are about between 10 to 14 times more likely to get lung cancer. So uh, just off the scale, when you're talking about things like passive smoke and welding fume, it is an astronomic risk if you are a smoker versus a non-smoker. No evidence that it differed between stainless and mild steel, and iron fume actually contributed in one of the studies as well, interestingly, to cancer risk. And um, a more recent meta-analysis has basically shown the same thing. So work since IARC have reclassified this has shown the same or indeed actually higher estimates, 87% increased risk of lung cancer. So we've come full, full circle. I'm just going to go show you two uh, remaining slides and then I'm going to finish. The point of my penultimate slide is as follows. That... These are HSC data relating to malignant mesothelioma related to asbestos, not in any way related to welding fume. But what they show is that we, we are sort of just peaking this even more horrific malignancy than lung cancer currently. There's some argument about when it will peak, but it's likely to drop. But at the moment, uh, there are more people yet to die of mesothelioma than have ever died of it, if you believe this distribution. But what is clear is that you could have predicted this from historic exposure to asbestos. So what this is saying to me is that asbestos use in GB all those years ago, we can use that to predict how many people die of mesothelioma. So what that means is today, 2023, the air quality in your workplaces and in your welding shops will predict the future respiratory health of your workers, including you. So that was the time to act, wasn't it? And so now is the time to act, to continue to protect workers' health when exposed to, to welding fume. And that's it, that's my final slide. And this is the um, Hawks Nest tragedy. This was a tunnel cut in West Virginia's um, hillside, exposing many predominantly men, some women, to high levels of respirable crystalline silica. There's still a mass grave there. I've been there to the site. It's an extremely somber experience. About 600 men died there because of the abject failure to appreciate that there was a hazard with an associated risk. It was called tunnelitis. It was called various things. But the reality was many of those men died from acute and accelerated silicosis over time. So thank you for your attention. Think welding, think lungs. Thanks very much, Ken.